very serious. So, okay, yeah, very good. I'm glad somebody uh, got the recording started. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so the Rambam uh, says that these 13 principles actually qualify a person when he believes in them, he or she, in, as, a, as a member of Klal Yisrael. And denying these principles um, actually disqualifies a, disqualifies a person from being a member of Klai Yisrael, which is very strong words. And the Ramam goes on to say, um, uh, I've, got, I've been very lengthy about this. And I've, I've gone outside the parameters of my typical composition. Avo, however, I did this because I see benefit in faith. I've gathered up um, very important issues spread around at various important sources. Therefore, da osam know them, baham, and be successful in them, bachazer alehem, and uh, re, re, repeat or review them pa'amim rabos many times. This is that the Rambam doesn't talk this way unless he means every word of it. Uh, the Rambam is very, very literate, literate and very specific in his words and very, very careful in every word he ever used. Chozer pa'amim rabos go over them many times. Behisponen bahem, hisponen yafa, and uh, contemplate them a deep and uh, powerful contemplation. Um, and and if your heart uh, convinces you, and you think that you have it all understood from one review, or from ten, God Himself knows that your heart has just convinced you about a falsehood. You cannot understand this by going through it once or by going through it ten times. Therefore, do not be hasty in reading it. I only composed what I what came to my hand, so to speak, after tremendous deep um, uh, investigation, the hispaniness and contemplation. Um, so therefore, the Rambam is telling us these are not simple things. And this is the philosopher of the Rambam. Um, and uh, who obviously is capable of extremely profound and subtle thought. And he's telling us that this stuff doesn't co didn't come easy to him and it shouldn't come easy to us and we should review it. Now, the re one reason that he tells us to review it is because there's a difference between knowing and being this stuff, which means as we're gonna see, um, most of these things, it's not difficult to say, yeah, I, I agree with that. But it's a totally different story to say that I am that I actually conduct myself that way. Uh, there's a big difference between something that we know is true and something that has internalized so much that we don't even have to check in with ourselves to see if we know it. I always use gravity as an example. Gravity is such an example. Nobody says I agree with gravity or I believe in gravity or I know there's gravity. You just live your life uh, so truly consistent with gravity that you never think about it. You don't check in with yourself and say, I wonder if gravity is working today. It's just so real to you that uh, everything you do is based on the fact that there's gravity. And uh, it's the same thing with these principles. The Ramam is telling us, review them and internalize them. And don't think you're going to understand them one time or 10 times. Um, because uh, it's not just a question of knowing them. It's also a question of having them the uh, not only profoundly understood, which the Rambam says can't be done in a simple Passover, but also uh, uh, have it become actually part of your consciousness. A person's behaviors are consistent with the way the world looks to them. So if you, if you say, yeah, I know there's a God, the Rambam is not satisfied with that. The Rambam wants you to have internalized that there's a God to the point where your behavior is consistent with that without having to figure out if today you still believe there's a God or no, there's a God. So that's, that's, this is a very important point that we should understand about what, what's going on here with these principles. Secondly, what we're going to do tonight, and uh, can't speak for the other speakers of the, of the other 12 principles, 
but I can tell you we're not going to do justice to the first principle. Um, we can't, not in a short time. We can, we can cover some outline, uh, we can cover some important points, but we're not gonna do full justice. Now, what, what, first of all, I wanna uh, um, do a very quick overview of the 13 principles and not in the Rambam's words. So if you have your eyes scroll sitter, open to page 178. I'm sure everybody's familiar with these animamins. There are at least two out of the 13 are rendered in music of one type or another. Um, but these animamins are a summary, not clear who authored this. Um, these are not the words of the Rambam. Uh, and to some degree, they're not even thoroughly accurate to what the Rambam's intention was, but they're enough for us to see the full uh, um, breadth of what the Rambam covers. So let's look at them very quickly. So we'll look at the English on page 179. I believe with complete faith, these are, again, these, the, this whole idea of Ba'amuna Shlema, complete faith with perfect faith, uh, nothing wrong with that, but those aren't the words of the Rambam. Um, that the creator, blessed is his name, creates and guides all creatures and that he alone made, makes, and will make everything. Okay, so God is the creator and uh, the only creator. Uh, we'll see that the, uh, the Rambam's words are much more detailed and add important dimensions here. Each one, it's true, but I just want to get the ideas here. Number two, uh, the creator, blessed is his name, is unique. There is no uniqueness like his in any way and that he alone is our God who was, who is, and who always will be. That's called the unity of God. Uh, three, I believe with complete faith that the creator, blessed is his name, is not physical. The incorporeality of God is not affected by physical phenomena. There's no comparison whatsoever to him. That's different than being unique. There's no, that's, uh, well, when we get there, we'll get there, we'll explain it. Number four, I believe with complete faith that uh, the creator is the very first and the very last. Number five, the creator, to him alone is a proper to pray, and it is not proper to pray to any other. Now, let's stop here. These first five deal directly with God. They tell us something about God in each one. The next one moves from the God and uh, deals with communication from God, meaning the truth of the Torah, prophecy. So number six, I believe with complete faith that all the words of the prophets are true, uh, I believe with complete, number seven, I believe with complete faith that prophecy of Moshe, our teacher, Allah Shalom, was true, and that he was the father of the prophets, both those who preceded him and those who followed him, meaning father of the prophets only means chief, it means uh, top, it does not have, have anything to do with progeneration. Number eight, uh, I believe that the entire Torah now in our hands is the same one that was given to Moshe, our teacher, Allah Shalom. Number nine, the Torah will not be exchanged, nor will there be another Torah from the Creator, Baruch Hu. Number 10, um, so now this, that we just finished from numbers six, seven, eight, and nine. We just dealt with the nature of God's communication to humanity, right? Prophecy, Torah. Torah, which it comes through the greatest prophet Moshe, and the nature of Torah itself, which is that what we have is the entire thing. God makes sure we have the whole thing, and it will never be changed. Now, we're going to deal with God, God's interaction with the world. So number 10, I believe that the Creator knows all the deeds of human beings and their thoughts. As it is said, He fashions their hearts altogether. He comprehends all their deeds. Number 11, the Creator, blessed be He, rewards with good, those who observe his commandments and punishes those who violate his commandments. So this is the principle of reward and punishment. And this again, governs his interaction with the world or describes, I shouldn't say governs, but describes. Number 12, uh, the coming of Mashiach. And even though he may delay, nevertheless, I anticipate every day that he will come. It's an important part of the principle. It's not just saying I'm a devotee of Messiah, it's saying that part of belief in Mashiach is anticipating his coming. Uh, and number 13, um, I believe that there'll be a resuscitation of the dead, whenever the wish emanates from Hashem, Baruch Hu, 
and uh, exalted is his mention forever and all eternity. Okay, so these are the 13 principles of faith. Mir Hashem, through, the, through, this, uh, through the 13 installments, we'll get a good flavor and a good analysis of each one of these. And before we get into any of them tonight, I want to uh, address the whole concept of principles of, of faith. So what, um, uh, but while we're at it, by the way, uh, maybe this is obvious to you, maybe it's not obvious, but it's worth just paying attention for a minute. If you're at the art school sitter, page 12, which is Yigdal, which um, some people don't know because they don't uh, attend Friday night services, but we, uh, many shows, close the davening on Friday night with Yigdal, and the many shows close the davening on Shabbos day with Adon Alam. But Yigdal, authored by somebody called <coughs> Daniel Ben Yehuda of Rome, probably in the 14th century, which is about 200 and something years after the Rambam wrote, uh, the 13 Principles, he wrote a poem. Actually, I, my understanding is that he actually uh, edited it a number of times uh, until he got it, what he considered to be accurate. But Yigdal is the list of the 13 Principles of Faith. That's all it is. So the davening ends with an assertion by the community of the 13 Principles of Faith, right? Nimsa ve'en eisam So, for example, um, he exists, right? and unbounded by time, right? He's first and last. He is unique or singular or one. He's inscrutable, which means also um, uh, he has no limited time. Again, the, the incorporeality of God. So you can see if you go through the whole thing, that the 13 principles that we just reviewed in the Amin Imamins these are brought out in the uh, in the Yigdo. Um, Gomeli, I'm skipping to three lines from the end. Gomeli ish chesed kimifalo. He deals with each person according to his actions. Nasein la rasha ra kavisha. So he gives to the evil one uh, punishment according to his evil. And then Mashiach. Um, this is all, and then so this is just a summary of the 13 principles of faith, which helps us understand why these 13 principles are so uh, ingrained in the consciousness of the Jew, not only because the Ramam authored them, which he did, which alone would give us a reason to uh, take them seriously, but also because uh, it, it must, almost every sitter that's ever been printed, we have a summary of the 13 principles at the end, and of course Yigdal is in there. Now, um, this is what did not come with some without opposition for two kinds of opposition. First of all, there are uh, other Rishonim, other authorities who they said, okay, great, good, uh, it's a good exercise, but why 13? Uh, so, for example, Yosef Albo, um, he reduced them to three. Um, uh, basically, the existence of God, the truth of the Torah. <coughs> and uh, reward and punishment. Um, and he felt that the Rambam's 13 were to some degree redundant, meaning that he felt that uh, certain uh, ones on the list could be covered by other ones. Uh, as we go through the list, well, we're not gonna do it together, there'll be other speakers, but uh, one of the important studies that we could undertake is to distinguish exactly why one is not covered by the other. It's a very important study when you go through these 13. Why would, um, why would one assertion about the nature of God not actually implicitly cover? No, for example, God knows all. Right? God is all knowing. And then the next one is God rewards and punishes everything that we do and think. Okay, so he can't do that unless he knows everything, right? So how are those two separate and why are they two separate things? That's an important study. But, um, but some Rishonim objected based on those kinds of questions, either because they did not understand the intention of the Rambam in his very uh, distinct assertion of 13 principles that he held were separate from each other, or because, um, or they just disagree. So what, is it, so what exactly is the Rambam trying to do? Um, let me ask this question another way. Not only was he trying to do, is there a mitzvah in the Torah to believe uh, that God, does the Torah say you shall believe that God rewards and punishes, right? Which is one of the principles. Does the Torah say you shall believe that a Mashiach, will, 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 a Mashiach ben David will come? Does the Torah say you are obligated to believe that there's chiyas So the Rambam 
Number one, he lists 13 principles of faith. Um, it's, a, it's, an, it's a heroic and courageous thing to do because there's a lot of things that are true in the Torah that the Ramam didn't list. For example, God is merciful. There's no limit to God's mercy. Why isn't that a principle? What makes that not be in the list? What criteria did the Rambam use to decide what's going to be in the list and what's not going to be in the list? Fascinating question. Or another one, God took us out of Egypt, not in the principles. God created the Jewish people out of nothing by taking us out of Egypt. It's not a principle of faith. Rambam does not assert that if a Jew doesn't believe that, that he does not have a share in Klal Yisrael. And he does not have a share in Olam Haba. He does assert that if a Jew says, I deny that God rewards and punishes, he is not a member of Klal Yisrael, and he does not have a share in the world to come. Right? So, but, but the exodus from Egypt is really very important. We're going to see it's really important in a minute. Um, but it's not in the principles of faith. So there's a lot of things that are true that are not in there. So what exactly is Ramah? But not only that, there's no mitzvahs to believe in these things. The first ikar, the first principle that God is the creator and causes everything to be and is not caused by anything, um, that, all right, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, this week's parsha, the first of the Ten Commandments, I am the Lord, your God, who took you out of Egypt. According to many Rishonim, that is a mitzvah. So that principle is a mitzvah. But the other uh, principles, there's nowhere in the Torah that says, you shall believe this. I'm not saying they're not true. I'm saying, uh, are these ikrim, are these mitzvos? The Rambam says you have to believe these things, right? These are, these are the basic, this is the creed. This is our creed. This is what forms our faith. If you believe something other than this, then you believe in another faith. You have another faith, but not the faith that God wants us to have. So it's an audacious thing for the Rambam to list these 13 things. And we have to know, like, where did he get them from exactly? So <clears throat> we're not going to go through that tonight, but I just want to raise the questions. Um, the, um, it's interesting. The Torah, if you, know, if you haven't noticed, the Torah talks a lot about behavior. It talks a lot about good people doing good things and bad people doing bad things. The Torah talks very little about belief. For example, with Avraham Avinu, Nowhere in the Torah does the Torah say, Avraham Avinu discovered God and rejected idolatry, and um, therefore God spoke to him and said, Lech Lecha. doesn't say that. With Noah, it says he was a good guy, and God spoke to him and saved him from the flood. With Avraham Avinu, there's nothing in the text that it tell, certainly doesn't talk about his, his intellectual challenge to society at the time in rejecting idolatry. The Torah doesn't talk about beliefs. So for the Ramam to come along and say there are 13 principles of belief, um, where did, exactly where does he get that from? It's been pointed out, by the way, that the word echad, aleph, one, ches, eight, dalad, four, totals 13. So the Ramam seemed to have a tradition that um, these principles of faith are going to be 13, which total the gematria of echad is 13. The 13 signifies one. Very interesting. And of course, um, God is one, and God is the source of everything. But again, where does, he, where does he get this idea of principles altogether? So I'm going to demonstrate tonight that there are actually, it's really, it's, it's, uh, it's hiding in, in plain sight. That if you read the Torah accurately, you'll actually get what the Ramam is, uh, is saying. But before we get into that, um, I want to point out, the Chavos Halavavos um, says, he's the classic, um, I don't know how to describe him. Um, uh, he's known as Rebbeinu Bachaye, um, one of the two Rebbeinu Bachias. So the Chavos Halavavos uh, sa says that since we know that there are, the, the mitzvahs correspond to various parts of our body, and since we know that what distinguishes a human being from all other creatures is our intellect, so he says there must be mitzvahs of belief. Where are the mitzvahs of belief, right? To correspond to the mind. The one thing that dis distinguishes a human being from everything else is our mind, is our intellect. So where are the mitzvahs of the intellect? Why are there no mitzvahs of the intellect? And he answers because 
the, the mitzvahs of belief are the context in which mitzvahs are done. In other words, mitzvahs are done because there is a creator. Mitzvahs are done because there's accountability. Mitzvahs are done because we know God said to do them through the Torah, uh, which means we know that there's prophets who we can rely on. So therefore, the point is that the context which causes us to do mitzvahs, masias, physical acts, taking a little of an esrog, that's, that's what the principles of faith are. So they're really, the, when it comes to mitzvahs of the mind, they're really just, they're the background that would then have us do mitzvahs. You know, in this week's parsha, the, the uh, Saras Hadibros, the first of the Ten Commandments, is, um, is uh, Anochi Hashem Elokecha. There's a big machlokas in the Mishanim, a big disagreement in the authorities as to whether or not that is counted as a mitzvah. Um, the Ramban, Nachmanides, does not count this first statement of the Aserah Sederos as a mitzvah, because he says, you can't have a commandment by a sovereign that you're listening to, which says, believe in me, because if it's a commandment, that's because you already are taking the sovereign as your, as your authority, and therefore, you already, it, it pre-exists the mitzvah. You can't have a mitzvah to surrender to an authority because uh, if you're following that mitzvah, that means he was your authority that made you surrender to him, right? So the Ramban says Anochi can't be a mitzvah. It's the source for doing everything else. Others do count it as a mitzvah. The Rambam actually counts as a mitzvah. The Rambam in the, in the laws of Yusariya Torah says that it's a mitzvah to know most of us understand that to mean that the Rambam is saying that it's not just a question of belief. You actually have to th- contemplate and think through and explore the possibility that he doesn't exist and that he's not God. And you're obligated to know, to reach a conclusion that he does exist. The Rambam definitely holds it to mitzvah, either to know or to believe, depending on how you translate the Aramaic, the uh, Arabic. Anyway, well, I'm, not, I'm not rambling here. My point is to say that the Ikrim form the context. They're not really a mitzvahs in and of themselves, but they form the context. Um, they're the premise of everything else. Now, Rabbi Hanan Wasserman opened up a very interesting um, uh, thought. And now it's, he just, it's not his own, but he just addresses this. If a person does a mitzvah and he doesn't believe in God, did he do a mitzvah? Let's say a person eats matzah on, on the 15th of Nisan at night at the Seder because it's a beautiful, wonderful ritual. He's not doing it to serve God. He doesn't even know if there is a God, right? So then he's, what Rabbi Hanan says, that's a Maisa Kofa Alma. That's like he's, uh, he's doing a meaning, he's doing a meaningless, meaningless action. It's like a monkey imitating a human being. In other words, a mitzvah is only a mitzvah if you're doing it in service of the authority, of the commander, right? Um, and if you're doing it in, in an attempt to connect with or connect to the authority, to the sovereign, right? So again, mitzvahs, all the actions that the Torah governs are only um, significant in the sense that they are a way of serving um, the creator. So therefore, the, the existence of the creator and the nature of the creator pre-exists mitzvahs. Um, now the Abarbanel, uh, objects really to the Rambam's assertion of 13 because he says, wait a minute, a Jew has to believe in every single word of the Torah, says the Abarbanel. So uh, how could you say that these 13 things you have to believe in and other things, uh, you, you may be wrong, but, you, but they're not absolutely essential. The Jew has to believe in everything. The Rambam himself says in principle number eight, the Rambam says that, you have, that the Torah is true the entire Torah that we have is the Torah that God gave us. And every word in the Torah, including um, locations and, and cities and so on and so forth, every single word is part of the Torah. And you have to believe every single word of it. Right? You, can't de- you can't deny even one letter in the Torah, says the Rambam. So the Rambam himself says that. So the Rambam doesn't understand exactly how do you have 13 critical belief statements when everything in the Torah has to be believed. And the Maharil, not the Maharal, but the Maharil, the Maharil, one of the building blocks of halacha, one of the major, um, um, yeah, one of the major underpinnings of halachic practice, he was opposed to the Yigdal poem because he based on the Gemara and Brachas that, um, that it was opposed to 
writing a, a scroll of Aser Sadibra, so the Ten Commandments. Uh, the Rambam himself was opposed to standing during Torah reading just for the Ten Commandments, because he said, you're not allowed to say that that's more significant than anything else. So then how do you end up with these, uh, these, these 13 principles of faith um, when you have this kind of opposition to the idea of choosing parts of the Torah and, and putting more emphasis on them than anything else? So I just want to mention, uh, and the Ravid, the Ravid, the, uh, the shadow boxer of the Rambam, wherever, whenever possible, if, you want to, if, if somebody argues with the Rambam, it's probably going to be the Ravid, Rabbi Ram ben David. So the Ravid says, when the Rambam says that if a person doesn't believe these things, he has no share in Olam Haba, the Ravid says, listen, the Rambam may be right that God has no body, but if a, an, of, a, of a sweet, holy Jew reads the Torah and sees that it says the hand of God, and he says, oh, God has a hand, so he's mistaken, but you're going to tell me he has no share in the world to come? Right, so uh, that's his that's his that's his his argument with the Rambam. So I want to make uh, this point. This is a very important point. What is the world to come? That's an important thing. That uh, what is the world to come? So, on the basic level, on the on the on the most unsophisticated and immature level, um, um, we tend to think of the world to come as after you live a hard life and you do the right thing, then after you die, you get paid back by having some kind of a very pleasurable, maybe spiritual, spiritually pleasurable existence. Um, um, and maybe, maybe you might even understand that there's after Trias HaMesim, when, you're reunited, you're, when you're, your soul and body are reunited, you get a whole bunch of, I don't know, you have a tremendous pleasure and maybe you're close to God or something like that, with some vague idea of some payback for living a good life. The truth is that the Rambam probably understands Olam Haba as nothing less and nothing more than the relationship with God that you created in this world that can't be realized in this world. In other words, um, this world is not created for connection. As a matter of fact, God removes himself very much from this world in order to create the world, to give the world independence. God is disconnected significantly from the world. Um, this world is not the world of relationship. It's the world of doing. And the relationship that's created through the doing, that relationship is fully realized in Olam Haba. Um, uh, meaning Olam Haba is the realm in which the relationship that's created in this world can finally be lived out. So it's not payback. It's not reward. It's reality. It's the reality that's been created in this world. And now it's, um, it's, uh, it's realized, so to speak. The relationship that's been created is realized. I always say, I use a very, a very simplistic analogy, but I think you'll get the point. Husband and wife are deeply in love and they're separated by responsibilities or whatever, whatever it is for months or years, West Coast, East Coast. And um, during the time that they're separated, there's two couples like this. One couple, the husband and wife, they send each other love notes all the time. And they send each other flowers and they, um, they're on the phone with each other. And right, but they're not with each other. They're just they're on two sides of the continent. Finally, they get together. When they get together, their relationship doesn't begin when they finally get off the plane and fall into each other's arms. Their relationship is already created and formed by the way they were behaving while they were on both sides of the continent, except they couldn't realize, they couldn't experience that relationship because they were physically separate. When they get together, the investment that they made in each other from before is now realized so they don't pick up where they left off. They actually created something new while they were separate by showing their care and love and affection for each other. The other couple, same circumstances, they said, hey, we're not really together. There's nothing we can do with each other. We'll wait till we get back together. We care for each other, but you know, we're not here. So they didn't call. They didn't send gifts. They didn't send flowers. They didn't send chocolate, whatever it was. They didn't do birthdays. When they get together, guess what? They created distance. And that's just the way it is. 
by, by, uh, by ignoring each other. So that's a simplistic example. Olam Haba is the realization of the relationship that was created in this world that couldn't have been fully realized in this world because that's not what this world is about. This world is about accomplishment. It's not about connection. Now, tzaddikim are already so aware of the connection with the Kaddish Baruch Hu, that they already have me'ein olam haba. They already have a part of olam haba in this world. So when the Rambam is talking about people who believe this, yesh lahem chelik l'olam haba, what he's saying is, uh, he's saying an interpretation of the Mishnah. Kol Yisrael yesh lahem chelik l'olam haba. Every Jew has a share in the world to come, which means every Jew is created, connected to God. And even if a Jew sins, that Jew is going to have to be accountable for his sins, but that Jew has an automatic default connection to his or her creator. Um, if a person doesn't know and believe these 13 basic things, then that person is relating to a different God than the one who really exists. It might be a God that's similar, but that's not God. That's your concoction. That's your maybe elaborate, developed uh, thesis, uh, theology, but it's not God. In other words, the 13 principles are an accurate description insofar as God will allow himself to be known in this world. Uh, in, uh, there is an accurate description of the relationship with God that God wants us to have with him. So for example, if a person doesn't know that God is all knowing, then he has a defective relationship with God. And therefore, he is not capable of having, this is the basic minimum standards or terms of the relationship with the Kodesh Baruch Hu. So therefore the Ribbon's objection, uh, the, the, it could very well be that if a person thinks the wrong thing about God, even if he's not evil, but he's missing the point, he doesn't have an accurate uh, idea of the God that he's relating to. And therefore he's forging a relationship with, uh, with another, with a non-existent being. Um, another side point related to this is, again, using a, a very simplistic analogy, if a person is very good friends, let's say a person has a roommate or a husband and wife, a, a, some ongoing close relationship, and um, one day he decides, you know, it's, it's uh, my friend's birthday or my wife's birthday, I'm going to get them, um, I'm going to get them some ice cream, right? And he goes to the store and he buys them a quart of ice cream to go celebrate their birthday. And he brings home a quart of chocolate ice cream. And the wife or the friend, whatever it is, says, it's so nice, but we've been together for like 15 years. You don't know that I don't do chocolate. I only like vanilla, right? So the point is that if you don't know the being that you're relating to, there's a, there is a distance in the relationship. So that's the, that's the point of these 13 principles. Enough said, but really not enough said. There's a lot more to say about this. Now, you'll, we pointed out that there are three categories in the 13 principles of faith. Uh, the first five, as we pointed out, deal with the nature of God. I, the next, uh, the next uh, group deals with uh, his interaction. Uh, well, it deals with actually the, his communication with the world, which is the Torah, prophecy and the Torah. And then the final group deals with his interaction with the world, the way he rewards and punishes. And even Tchiyas HaMesim and Mashiach are a form of reward and punishment as, well, we're not going to see that tonight. But the point is that if you think about it, this is exactly what we do on Rosh Hashanah. The 13 principles of faith actually cover what we say on Rosh Hashanah. Malchios, Zechronos, and Shofros. Malchios' statements are affirmations of God in his capacity as a royal figure, as a king. Zechronos is... Uh, an affirmation of God as the one who interacts with the world and rewards and punishes and holds us accountable for our actions. And Shofros is a depiction of revelation of, of the, show, the presentation of the Torah at Har Sinai. So Malchus, Akronis, and Shofros really cover the 13 principles of faith, or the 13 principles of faith reflect Malchus, Akronis, and Shofros. They're very basic. It's a, it's a whole package. If anybody comes to you Anybody comes to you and says, there's a new government and you're a citizen, or there's a new religion <clears throat> and you're, you want to know about it. So the first thing you want to know is who's in charge? What's the nature of this power that's in charge? 
right? If you have a new religion, okay, who are you worshiping? Um, how do you know? How do you know? Did you make it up? How do you know it's true? That's called the communication from God. That's the Torah. And who cares? What, who, how does it make a difference? That's God's interaction with the world. God knows all, cares about what we're doing, reacts to what we're doing. Oh, okay, the creator, okay, now it matters. All right, so that's the, but these are three basic ingredients that you need with any, any system uh, that makes a difference, any system of authority. Certainly a system that has to do with, with serving the creator of the universe. Okay. Um, let's start with the first principle. Um, but in order to do that, let's start with the first mitzvah. Very interesting. The first mitzvah, um, when I mean, I don't mean chronologically as it appears in the Torah, but the first mitzvah, logically, the first mitzvah is God, belief in God, according to those authorities that agree that it's a mitzvah. The first mitzvah is, I am, I am the Lord your God. So what does God say when he introduces himself? Um, meaning when he really introduces himself at Mount Sinai, at Revelation, when they all hear his voice, when they see as much as any human being can see at Revelation, Ten Commandments. He says, Anochi Hashem Elokecha, Asher Sicha Me Eretz Mitzrayim. God says, you want to know me? Refer back to Egypt. I, I am the Lord your God. Who am I? What do you want? What do I want you to know about me? Asher Hotzei Sicha. I'm not defining myself as the creator of the universe. You're going to know me by referring back to Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Right? This is a major clue. If you really want to know what God wants us to know about him, study the story of the exodus from Egypt. And then through what is revealed there, you'll end up knowing what God wants us to know about him. Will we know God fully? Never. Why? We're limited human beings. We cannot know the unlimited with a limited um, bandwidth. Um, and, and language itself is a function of human beings. And language, therefore, cannot be adequate to describe everything about God and totally um, uh, encompass everything about him. We can only know what God wants us to know about him. So God says, I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. Okay. So I want you to take your Chumash and open up to Shmos chapter 29, verse 46. Let's see what happens there. And let's see, Chan Shmos 29, verse 46. I'm going to be surprised also because I forgot what I wrote here. Verse um, 46. Yep. Okay. All right. V'yodu ki ani Hashem elokeihem. They shall know that I am the Lord your God. Asher hotzeisi osam eretz Mitzrayim l'shach mi who took Who took them out of Egypt to dwell with them. Okay. Very interesting. So God is saying that, again, I'm identifying myself with the Tzias Mitzrayim, right? Um, in Bamidbar, uh, chapter 15, you don't have to turn there. It's really, most of us know it by heart. It's the third paragraph of Shema. Uh, and the last sentence of the paragraph says, I'm the Lord your God. Who took you out of Egypt? His signature, right? The way to know him is keep on going back to Egypt. Go back to look what happened in Egypt. So we're going to look at that in a minute. But one more pasuk just to show you. In Vayikra 25. Okay, that's Leviticus 25. And I could show you many other as well. 25, 55. So pasuk 55 and chapter 55. It's in chapter 25. And that is After he gives us the laws of um, of um, uh, laws of uh, ownership of land in Israel, he says, "Kili bnei Israel avadim." For to me are bnei Israel servants. Avadai heim, they're my servants. Asher hutsesi osam eretz tzayim, which I took out of the land of Egypt. Right. And once again, he's the avo, the avoda, the service that we're going to provide him is based on, I am God who took them out of Egypt, right? So again, this is all over the place. 
we tend to ignore it. It's all over the place. We, yeah, I got it. I know you took me out of Egypt. Okay, enough already, right? But the point is that God keeps on saying, Egypt, Egypt, Egypt. That's how you want me to, that's how I want to be known. All right, so, um, so let's see. I want to show you the 13 principles laced into Yetzirah Mitzrayim. Okay, so the first five principles, they're basically the existence and the nature of God um, that's pretty clear. If you just know the whole story of the Makos and the interaction that God runs everything and that, um, and that, and that he is in control and that he is the source of everything. Um, the principles 10 and 11, uh, reward and punishment. God knows all that's Moshe and the miracles. That's Moshe and, what, and, and his warning to the Egyptians and then the Egyptians suffering the consequences and the Jews being spared at the same time. That's reward and punishment. Um, uh, the, the prophecy, uh, the prophecy of Moshe, it's very interesting. The last Pasuk and Chumash, we, we also tend to miss the significance of this, but look at the last Pasuk and the last chapter of the, of the last book of Chumash, Deuteronomy. The very end, there's nobody, there's nobody like Moshe, right? And it says, no, there arose no prophet in Israel like Moshe who knew God face to face um, as evidenced by, is how they translate it here. That'll be good enough. L'chol ha'osos v'amosim as evidenced by all the signs and miracles and wonders which God sent him to do in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to his servants and all his land. So how do you know that Moses was a great prophet? Look what he did in Egypt. Not how do you know that Moses was a great prophet because look what happened in the desert, right? All the things that he said um, uh, that he did in the land of Egypt. So it's, in, again, so therefore Moses' prophecy and prophecy itself is established through the story of Yetzirah Mitzrayim. Uh, the idea of Torah, Minah that the Torah comes from God and that it's true, principle eight, and that it won't change. So, um, um, take a look at the, for example, Shmo's chapter three, Exodus chapter three. This is God talking in Egypt. He's actually talking to Moshe at the burning bush. Chapter three, verse 12. Well, Yomer, God said, I'll be with you. This is the sign that's going to prove it. That I sent you, Moshe. When you take out the people from Egypt, you're going to serve, worship God. That's Matan Torah, the giving of the Torah on this mountain, right? So the giving of the Torah was one of the major points, was the major point. God says, this is the sign that I sent you, that you're going to come out and you're going to get the Torah right here on this mountain, right? So again, the Torah. Uh, as a purpose, uh, as a, a message from God is right here established in Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. And then Moshe is saying to Paro, Shalach Yavduni, send out my people that they may serve me. What avoda we're talking about? We're talking about Matan Torah. That's what God, Moshe is saying to Paro, send us, send, in the name of God, send out my people that they may serve me, meaning they're going to become my avodim through the acceptance of the Torah. That's all right there, laced into Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. Now Mashiach, Mashiach, where does Mashiach come in in Exodus from Egypt? Well, first of all, the Exodus from Egypt itself is the blueprint for all future redemptions. All redemptions that the Jewish people ever experienced or need to experience are embedded in Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. That's number one. Um, but very explicitly in Shmos chapter 3, verse 14, Kodesh Baruch Hu says, when Moshe wants to know what name he has, what name he should use to identify him to the Jews, God says, Ehiyah Asher Ehiyah, which is, uh, right, which translated almost meaninglessly, I will be that which I will be. But Rashi says that that means I will be with them in their exile and I will be with them in the redemption, in all future redemptions. So right there, God is saying that I will always be the redeemer, the savior of the Jewish people. Tchiyas HaMesim, the, uh, the, the assertion of life after death, that's a relatively simple, but maybe not. And that's the Song of the Sea. Ashira Lashem, uh, um, Az Yashir Moshe, then Moshe and Ben Israel Yashir, 
will sing. And the sages say, what do you mean will sing? The Torah is describing that they did sing. Past tense would be appropriate. And they say, they can the trias amesim in a Torah. From here we see trias amesim already laced into the Torah. So they, they will sing because even though they already sang, they'll sing again when they come up from the dead. Now, on a simple level, it's appropriate for Trias Mason to be disclosed there because that's when the Jewish people were given life. They were basically, as a nation, given up for dead twice. But one in the servitude in Egypt, and then another time when the Egyptians come up to them right at the Yom, so they have nowhere to go. And so Trias Mason, as a matter of fact, the tour says that Trias Mason, life after death, will occur in the month of Nisan. Why? Because that's the month that Trias Mason originally occurred, so to speak. Um, with, in, um, in uh, Egypt. So I'm just demonstrating that Yitzhiyaz Mitzrayim has all the 13 principles of the faith embedded in it. So that God says, you want to know me? You want to know how to relate to me? Just study Yitzhiyaz Mitzrayim and you'll get the whole thing. You'll get all these 13 principles. When a person dies, the, um, he's asked, see peace of the Yeshua. Did you anticipate, did you yearn for redemption? Where in the Torah does it say to re- yearn for redemption? The answer is from our belief in Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. It took you out of Egypt, just like you believe in me as your savior then. I'm telling you, believe in me now as the one who took you out of Egypt. So believe me as your savior and you believe in me as your savior in the future. Okay. That's why a person is asked, did you anticipate salvation? All right, now very quickly, here we are at 926. We're finally getting to some amplification of the first principle. We'll try to make this fast. Um, God can handle the speed. So he won't, be, uh, he won't be upset that we're only giving him four minutes directly on the first principle. But I think this introduction is very important, this overview. So um, the, first of all, I want to read you an English translation of the Rambam's own words. Um, the, the first principle to believe in the existence of the creator, may he be blessed, meaning that there is an existence that is perfect and absolute, uh, existence that is perfect and absolute in all facets of it, uh, and, and in all facets of existence. He is the cause of all that exists, the sustenance of all, and through him all is maintained. There is no possibility that he does not exist because without him, all existence would cease to be and nothing would remain. Whereas, if we would imagine the absence of all existence other than his, the existence of God would neither cease nor diminish. For he is self-sufficient in his existence, he suffices in himself, and his existence requires nothing other than himself. For among the intelligent beings, the angels and the constellations and all that they contain and all that is below them, they all need him for their existence. This is the first principle as affirmed by the verse, I am the Lord your God, which is uh, the, the first of the Ten Commandments. So he said a lot of things there. So first of all, what he's saying is he's the only cause, right? So which means that there is nothing other than him. The only reason anything exists is because God caused it to be. There's that, which means there's no other power. There's nothing else. There is, not only that, there is nothing else because it only came, it didn't come into being for a scientific reason, like this molecule got together with that molecule or this atom did this because that would be the reason, that would be the source of the thing's existence. But no, he is the only cause and nothing exists without him causing it. Um, which also means if we want to know him, the only way we can know him is through knowing what he causes. So we look around. If we examine the world and we see um, the and we and we see the world, we will ultimately be able to know the cause of the world. Ultimately, not immediately, but ultimately. It also means that God didn't create once and then go away and turn the world onto automatic and let it float around and do whatever it does, because if the world was called into being by nothing other than the will of God, then nothing other than the will of God keeps it going because there's no other force. It's only the will of God. That's all there is, is God's word. So therefore, he's constantly creating, meaning I I, I have the optical illusion that I got here an hour ago 
and there I decided that I'd be here. And then I turned on my Zoom and then I spoke to you. And now I remember how I started the class and I remember that I made uh, Marsha Straczynski. So I have a memory of myself as if I was already existing independently, but that memory itself is an optical illusion. The reality is that if he didn't will me to exist at this second, I would not exist, literally. I'm only here and the rock is only here and the chair is only here and electrons are only here because he wills them. There's nothing else causing them to be. Since they could only, they only came into being by his will, there's, no, there's nothing else that could cause it to be. Therefore, he's constantly ongoing creating. Now, um, I'm going to skip the next couple of points because they're very, very, uh, uh, I would say esoteric and sophisticated and they require a lot of background. So we'll skip to that. But it also means if God is absolute, now we can relate to the Torah as absolute. Meaning without having that the God's existence is absolute and that in, as independent of anything else, then the word that comes from him can be absolute, can be true. Because if God is not absolute, then the Torah itself could be caused by whatever causes God, right? So the, the, the absoluteness of God's existence actually speaks to the, to the, uh, to the absoluteness of the Torah itself. Um, also, what, once we have it, that God is the source of everything, so we serve the source. We don't serve anything in between. Um, it's also important for us to realize that inherent in this principle is that the difference between man and God is not that God is a super man, right? It's not a quantitative difference that God is just us times 500 million, but that God is qualitative. He's totally, because of the fact that he causes the world and the world doesn't cause him, he's not part of the world. And therefore he's qualitatively of a totally different being. He's not us, but more. He's just, uh, because we didn't cause him and he caused us. And uh, had he not caused us, we wouldn't be here. Therefore, he's, in a, he's a totally different kind of metzius, a def different kind of reality. And it also means he's unchanging because since, he, uh, since nothing caused him, there's nothing that can affect him. Change can only be when there's something interacting with him and causing and causing something but in, in, in since god is the source of everything he's unchanging there's no change in his mood there's no change in his nature there's no change in his power um, um and so those are some of the implications of this of this um first principle that god is the first cause and nothing caused him and he's actually also what's involved here is that he's separate from the world that's where the term HaKadosh Baruch Hu, we'll close with this. The term HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Holy One, blessed be He, is not just a religious term that, you know, we use because it uh, sounds good. HaKadosh means the one who's removed, the one who is totally separate from the world, but Baruch Hu, but He's blessed. What does it mean blessed? Blessed means He's the source of blessing. So here's this being that's totally removed and not part of the world. He's above and separate from the world, causing the world, and therefore has nothing to do with, there's nothing about him that is in this world, nothing like him in this world, because he created it. Everything in the world is a creature, and he's a creator, totally opposites. And yet, Baruch Hu, he's the source of all blessing. He's involved and invested in the world, and he's, uh, he is the source of bracha. So HaKadosh Baruch Hu, describes the Jewish idea of a Kaddish Baruch Hu, of the of the Creator, that he's totally separate and, and and not of this world, and yet invested in and interacting with and providing for this world. So that's the first principle, and I think I hope we, you you um, got a view of what the Rama is trying to accomplish here with these principles, and how uh, our relationship with Hashem is to be. Uh, formed and discovered through our uh, contemplating Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, and that's why Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, the exodus from Egypt, is so basic to our psyche, um, and, um, uh, and uh, also, uh, just to review, the whole idea of the relationship with Hashem that is realized in Olam Haba, and that's why these Ikrim are so critical, because 
they accurately define the nature of God. And these are the ones that the Rambam felt are absolutely required for us in order to be able to have the minimum relationship with God that God wants us to have. Okay, thanks for your attention. I, let me just check the chat very quickly, just in case somebody had a burning question and maybe you should have met. Oh, there's five chats there. Sorry about that. Uh, okay, allow late registrants to come in. I hope that was done. Uh, thank you, sponsors. Oh, wow. I did not know that. And I'm please forgive me for not knowing that. But Zahava Curlin sponsored this uh, presentation in loving memory of Selma and Dan Burke. Yes, we announced that on Shabbos. Thank you so much. Um, okay. And was this recorded? 80% or 90% of it was recorded. Um, okay, let's see what else. Yeah, it is recorded, and you can certainly get access to it by calling the office because we're going to get a, um, a, a digital copy of it. It comes usually within a with less than an hour. Okay. Thank you all for your attention. Great to see you all. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Yashikach. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. 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 Totally welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Great.